I'd like to obviously start by acknowledging the Larakia people and their generous spirit and practice uh, always supporting the university, especially in these sorts of events. Uh, and also, of course, although I thought they'd all be here, to acknowledge the Warramri families, particularly from Gawa, um, the various uh, family members who you've seen lots of already this morning, but without their generous accepting of Valanda to come to Gawa, uh, I obviously wouldn't be here. Uh, so the story I'm going to tell really is about Gawa a little bit and the school at Gawa. Uh, I feel quite inadequate in many ways, not being normal and not being a lady, especially when it's <laughs> Aboriginal cosmology, talking about uh, gender. Um, but the second part of the sentence was a public policy. Uh, and so I guess uh, the story is more about how some of these issues have helped shape the school which is a public policy issue of education and how to best do education. So that's how we see it fitting along. Um, so I'm going to do it reasonably informally. I've just put some slides together and just going to talk to them really. So to start off with, uh, the story uh, is a, going to start with the word Walme. Now Walme is one of the seasons see those beautiful charts uh, of the Warramri seasonal chart as the year goes around. Uh, and why I picked that title, A World Without Walmart, is because when I was first teaching at Gawa, I was desperately trying to find out as much as I could about Warramri, language, culture, and um, one of the nice books that was in the library was uh, Man of All Seasons, well before its time back from the 80s around the old season, the living of the country. Except it doesn't have the season Walmart in it. Each chapter goes through one of the seasons. And so I asked Gupta, why doesn't this book have Walmart? Or why do you talk about Walmart and uh, this book doesn't? And she said, oh, that's one of the Watermere seasons. A few of the other clans also have that, but not everyone. We don't all share everything. We share lots of things, but we all have our own special things as well. And from that moment, it stuck out to me as quite an eye-opening idea, not just had to learn about the Yonmu universe or the cosmos, but the actual clan-specific uh, knowledge that was there. And how sad it would be if the word Walmay dropped off, uh, if the concept Walmay dropped off. And how could we at the school, which was good as express desire, how could we build a school on the Wadamari understanding of the world? So the story is really an attempt to say how we've been trying to do that from the beginning of the school and my little role in helping push that along. Um, if you don't know anything about the Gawa homeland, it's on the top of Elka Island. Uh, we already saw that picture from Ian. Uh, if there are many homelands, of course, across Elka Island and across Arnhem Land, and Gawa is just one of them. The practical story is really quite inspiring in terms of literally cutting a road through the bush, sleeping on the beach with families, and really just saying this is the vision and we're going to stick to the vision and make it happen. The water and the connected families really doing it without any government support and just getting it done bit by bit by bit. However, deeper than the practical story, as exciting as that is, is, I guess, the deeper story of why. Why did they want to go to Gawa? Why did they really want a school at Gawa? Uh, and here are some of uh, the reasons. Uh, most of this presentation, I've just put up some quotes, if you don't see them, from either Gutta or the old man at Gawa, uh, around why they are there. What, what's, the, what's the reason? Uh, one of them is, put this story there, is that her father, clan father, told her to go there. So he actually said, you should go back. You should take uh, the families back and live at Gawa, uh, as opposed to Gullawinka. Not that Gullawinka was bad, but he could see, she says, that things would get worse. And so there were some practical things around health, alcohol, drugs, things squished together in Gullawinka that he said, it would be better if you're on the Watermere homeland. Um, Wallum's take is very similar, except he, he positions the country actually calling them back. 
uh, and each person in their own time responding to the call, I guess. Uh, so there's two sort of powerful elements of uh, family, person saying we should do this, and the country itself saying it's time. And as I said, the story, the practical story, really started there. Um, beyond set, establishing the actual homeland, and then slowly a building, and then another couple of buildings, uh, there was always a desire to have a school. And for a while, it was just an, a homeland learning center out of Galawipu. Uh, and what there was the sort of teacher loaned to, to work there. Um, a number of years later, after various negotiations, the community partnered with the Northern Territory Christian School Association to put a permanently built school there and a permanently staffed school. And some of these images and other things sort of speak of the partnership approach that was established then. And to be honest, um, and to give them their due, the Christian school system actually pumped in the right amount of money they were getting for the school and actually turned it into actually a school with the adequate resources and staffing. However, it was never supposed to be a ball in the school. It was never supposed to be, right, we want a brand new school, right? Okay, so you can just roll in and do education that happens everywhere else. It was always supposed to be a Watermary school uh, on Watermary land with Watermary language particularly as part of the curriculum. Uh, one of the issues on Elton, as many of you would know, is that children may, in theory, have their language from their father's clan, but generally end up speaking Jumba point. Figure that's sort of become the lingua franca of the, of the community. Not everyone, but a lot of people growing up like that. So one of the concerns was our languages are falling by the wayside, not just to English, but to also um, Jumba And so what this very strong feeling was that the Gawa Christian School should help maintain the modern language as well. And to be a Christian school. Uh, there's no doubt that that's very explicit in the community that they wanted a Christian school as well. Uh, and some of that was harking back to the mission days and the best of the mission day schooling and wanting to drag that and, and keep that at Gawa. Um, so this sort of profoundly place-based education is also reflected in a couple of quotes here, uh, in that Gawa was always had a place where some of the special young men's ceremony happened, back sort of further in, a little bit. Uh, so it was already known as a place of education, and what is referring to that here. And particularly this quote from Wildall, um, when I went and asked him a few years ago, how should school work, particularly with language? You know, should, should the Balanda teachers have what are we language in school, or should we leave it to you at home, or how should it look in terms of a curriculum? And his answer was really quite profound, I think. He essentially says here, um, the school is at home. The school is home. <coughs> So it's once they're there, they are home. There's no, you should know this is school and this is home. The school is home because it's at Gawa. So this is quite a profound concept that, of course, the school would join us in teaching language because we're, we're home. Gawa is home. So uh, it's undoubted that the school was always established on these sorts of principles um, long before I was there. South. That was already sort of the foundation, probably that foundation. That was one of the foundations for, for the school. Some people call that a sort of on country education. Um, a next step across that uh, you quickly learn if you live there uh, or teach there is that there's a desire to use country to actually teach as well, not just to be on country, but to learn or teach through country, one might say that the resources of growing up Jamapoli and all the things, some of the wonderful presentations we had, most of them went to school at Gawa and, and grew up in that holistic fashion. Um, they talked about it being inside, which of course is very true, but it's also from the land informing that inside and bringing it out. And so there's this idea that everything that is around us is the curriculum already. 
of the land, the things to eat, the things to not eat at certain times or to hunt in certain places or certain seasons is all there. The winds, the tides, that is all part of a proper education. Uh, and in fact, Buddha is often saying that's the sort of knowledge that is being lost in town or can be lost in town. Because people, the kids are just literally not at home, their homes, different homelands to actually learn this. So we've got the sort of on country education aspiration and a through country uh, education uh, aspiration. Coupled with that is this concept of both ways education. Uh, and both ways has a long history, some of you would know it very well, both particularly in education. So both ways has um, its own sort of history itself now, really, uh, coming out of both Elko and Yithkala and other Yongle um, schools, especially from the 80s, around mixing of the two epistemologies, mixing of the two philosophies of education, Balanda and Yongle. And there's many images that have been written about by Michael Christie and others at the uni uh, helping explain, and from many of them too, what they meant by both ways education. So the, the Garma area where the waters mix is one of them, famous one, the Garma idea of the public ceremony and education being similar to that, we come and we negotiate what we will then take forward, um, the Galta sort of coming in and saying, right, we've now decided this is now the curriculum. And there are many others as well. Um, so that's part of Gawa's background. Uh, also went to Bachelor College and studied at the same time that many of these people studied. So that's sort of both ways. Sometimes it's called two ways, but two ways can mean many other things as well. So it's probably simpler to call it both ways. And then as we learned this morning, touched on from here, which was great, the Warramuri themselves have a sort of profound both ways heritage already, <laughs> and not just about education, but around intercultural mixings and integrations with Macassans, with older people in Macassans, uh, and of course then with Christianity as well. And uh, Budamara, besides being a leader in many other areas, was also very clearly a leader in this, we want Christianity, but we also want our traditional knowledges if we want them both ways. We want it together. And there's a couple of famous movements which we don't have time to talk about now, but were very clearly dating way back to the 50s. Uh, were explicitly trying to bring those two things together to honour them both. So that's all part of the Warramuri background to the Gawa Christian School and the sorts of things that uh, the elders want. Of course, you don't know all that when you first arrive. Uh, you don't know anything when you first arrive. So it takes a long process of slowly learning this and sometimes still not learning it really adequately, but attempting to honour what you're hearing as to be the um, how the school should look. Um, thankfully, what the, I'm not really sure why, but over the last 10 or so years, made some decisions to actually share some of this <laughs> publicly. Uh, Came and work at the uni, um, going to conferences, uh, making speeches. Uh, I think, again, it's probably part of the Warramuri heritage of actually wishing to explicitly share uh, the understanding. Uh, perhaps it was taking on that mantle upon herself more clearly, but Whatever the reason, over the last decade or so, she has started to do that. She has then delivered her own imagery. Uh, I think she's going to talk about the way tomorrow, I believe, so I won't steal any thunder there. So I um, but there's other ones she's also shared. Some of my favourites, uh, where she talks about the Māori, which is the watery crayfish, how they, when they come, they sort of come at a certain time of the year when the water gets cold enough and then they go away again when the water gets too hot. But they walk side by side, literally side by side across the sea floor. It's actually quite amazing. Uh, from a long, long way. But uh, she developed that idea of the two crayfish walking side by side as an image for education at Gawa. She used the Jodhara story, actually, uh, around how 
sometimes Ballina can be like the Macassans coming in and not entering into both ways communications. We're still doing it like this, which like the Macassans are offering good things, right? Others, but if you don't actually have proper communication, the people will say no thanks. You just carry on, but no thanks. And there's a number of other stories that she's shared. Um, I think she's not here, so I can say. I think to tell the world this is what we want. This is really what we want uh, in terms of education at our place at Gun. <coughs> and thankfully, as Linda has said, uh, I think the sort of academic world has now acknowledged the strength of some of that. And some of those accolades which have come through over the last few years are uh, well and truly deserved. And it's excellent to see because there's some really deep thinking. If you're interested, I can point you out some of the presentations. Okay, bringing this all together, so what does it actually look like you know, as a school, and particularly in a literacy sort of focus? Um, here are some other quotes. I mentioned the desire to uh, not just have Jumbo Pond, but what I'm reading, taught in the school. There's a whole lot of challenges around that, but we'll come back to that. Um, we already saw this quote of the loss that is occurring, it's bit by bit, colour by colour. Um, this one is more about, again, the through country idea that when young people learn on the proper foundation, they grow in that confidence. And then you can see people come. It wasn't so good this morning. You can see the confidence there because they know who they are. And so then, and Gupta has always said this, then they can step out into the bigger world. And I think we had just such a wonderful evidence in that this morning, which comes from being on, on country. Um, similarly, um, not having the curriculum slowly be dominated by Balada concerns. Uh, of course, one of the realities over the last 10 years as teachers in the room would know is that there's been a standardised curriculum. You, know, you used to have an NT curriculum in South Australia and there was a bit more flexibility. The Australian curriculum came in, everyone's got to do the same. Same with every year. So if you're doing history in year three, you're all learning this. And that's the new norm. That creates some troubles for this sort of um, pedagogy as well. Um, and that's interesting for the teachers. And that's interesting, <laughs> indeed. There's troubles all around. But yes, uh, mm -hmm. certainly it's problematic for here. This is another big one at Gawa, uh, and I, I mentioned some, somewhere this morning um, the relationship between the teacher and the learner. Uh, and this is the one that's sometimes called two way that whilst I'm teaching, I should be learning. Now, it's actually quite easy to do a Gawa because you're immersed in a very small community and if you have even the slightest inclination, you'll be learning all the time. Learning of the land, learning of the language, learning of the culture. But to explicitly uh, be able to encourage that in a classroom uh, is uh, a good challenge to have and something that most teacher training organisations don't really teach you to think about. So it was an interesting one to say, well, how am I the learner? How do I foster that in the class? So all of those things, I guess, are the backdrop to what Gawa Christian School can look like and how they want it to look like. Um, this led um, us on to just think maybe um, we could put together a website. So because beyond doing all that sort of speaking and presenting, Gutha also had this amazing array of digital resources stored on her trusty Macintosh computer. Uh, over many years of recording people, sometimes it's a story about a season, sometimes it might just be a woman's crying song. Something. It could be, a, there's a whole range of them. And she'd bring them in and we'd look at one in class and say, that's amazing, wow, that's fantastic. And then two weeks later, she'd bring us something completely different. Whoa, that's just amazing as well. And I remember thinking, but what happens if that Macintosh falls in the water? You know, it's all gone. Um, so the thinking was, could we perhaps collate them into something? And at the time, websites seemed like the way to do it. Um, and we started looking at the idea of the posters were born out of that with some other friends uh, who helped her. But it was a similar sort of idea of, can we look at collating the various things you've got uh, into a seasonal framework 
So perhaps the curriculum could just continue to sort of turn on the seasons. And within each season, all the other things that you collected could sort of slot in there. It didn't work with everything. There were certain bits which didn't really fit a seasonal approach, but an amazing amount of things you could say, well, that would fit best there. If it's a story about honey and hunting for honey, well, where, which season would that fit into? Or if it was a story about the Macassans, well, they came on this wind, so if it's an arrival story of the Macassans, well, maybe that will slot into that particular season. So it was very sort of just in our heads, but the theory was, could the website help function as the curriculum itself? Okay. Uh, so I guess we coined the phrase, from, maybe from country, education from country. It's actually taking an active role, the lead role, in determining the curriculum. Uh, the other benefit was, for the new teachers that would continually come and go, <laughs> They already have something to start with there, rather than go, what do we do? Once we start realising what people want us to do, but what do we actually then do? It would maybe provide a bit of a, uh, a platform to actually quickly get up to speed, rather than taking two years to realise what you um, would be good to do. Um, the other part of it was, and, and this is what uh, what there's alluding to here a little bit, is that the idea is, children grow in knowledge, um, they learn more and more of the inside truths. So there's layers upon layers of your knowledge, and we've heard that mentioned by some of the ladies, you know, here I am and one day I'll be here, and, and that starts way back at a young age. So the thinking was maybe there'd be certain things that everyone could do even from the youngest years, and as they grow on and go up through the school, more layers could be introduced based on what the old people think the kids are ready for. So you might have resources tucked away in there that aren't used for a few years, but once that group gets old enough and mature enough, then you'd introduce some of those things to them. So it was an attempt, although a clumsy one, to have to build in that layering uh, epistemology a little bit. Um, so we were carrying on with this over the last few years, just uh, bit by bit. Uh, the Cosmology Project came along and it seemed that there was some synergy there. Um, some of the, we talked about what cosmology even means, it means so many different things. But for me, at least, it was sort of cosmology, not so much about the stars, not so much about creative narratives necessarily, but cosmology as an overall, how do you understand the world and how do you understand yourself in the world? What do you think is important? How do you know what you know is true? All those sorts of um, metaphysical questions. It's sort of what some people call cosmology. So I ran with that one and said, I think what we're doing is linked to that to some extent. Um, hopefully, that the idea of who I am being coming from multiple identities, as I said actually, already in the Yongle cosmos. Um, the epistemology, this layered idea, we thought was sort of in there a little bit. And particularly the, the primacy of land, how important land is as a sort of value. Um, so when Linda said, would you like to sort of join with the project? I said, yes, absolutely. This sounds like uh, it really fits the same sort of thing Gawa has been pursuing uh, for the last 15 years or so. So what I wanted to do now um, was actually show you an example of a text that Buddha has put together. Uh, as an example of the text itself, uh, it also, I think, raises some of those issues of who am I, there's multiples, the land itself, uh, and um, knowledge as well, all tucked up in the story. So I want to sh show you one of the, the stories that she wrote, a little parable called uh, The New Wax, by Yung Tagon Joy, and then talk about how, at least for one term, we use that in the, the curriculum as an example. That sound right? Okay. I think it should. He's not here. He was supposed to introduce, but he's actually uh, narrating it here. The New Wax by Katie Gutayaka. Okay. Um, these, these texts are both in Wadamari and English, but I, I thought that you would just do it in English uh, and me. But uh, let's, that might be as big as it gets. Can you see that, all right? Yes. 
or I think I just have to click the wrong one. Hey kids, have I told you the story about the bees and the new legs? They would fly to far away places in search of trees and bushes with flowers and wets. When they found it, they would bundle it up and carry it back to their hive. There they began to work very hard with the pollen and the wax. After they made the wax, they would enclose all the pollen with it. It was very hard work. Then one day some strange people came from far away place to put fishermen on the roads in Valencourt. They brought lots of big machines to work with the picture. All the people were excited to see the arrival of the picture. And who else was excited about the picture? Do you know, little ones? <coughs> yes, the bees were also excited. Because they all saw and heard about the new talent that had arrived already made. The news spread out everywhere. All the bees came. They called themselves together to talk about the new towel wax. Let's use the new towel wax. We won't have to go and look for wax or work hard to make it. Let's all get together and work with the new towel wax. They saw that the new wax was easier for them to work with. But when it was finished, what kind of taste do you think the honey might have that was made in vision? How do you like the honey that comes from a hive of tar? God gave the bees very good wax to work with. He made a good way for the little bees. Take care of this way well, and the honey will taste beautiful and sweet. In the same way, God has given us a good law so that we can work together to make a good way of living for ourselves and our little ones. In this way, we can come together and live as one people. Not out by ourselves, chasing our own ideas. Let's not be like the honeybees. Let's not work and live by a fire law anymore. This is what the story says to me. Let's not be too quick to get excited about new things, new ways and new roles. Let's not be like the honeybees who were chasing after an important thing that came along. Doing this would not be good for us or for our children. Let's look back to the way that our ancestors lived. 
how they shared and made a good law and worked together. Learning this, we can stand and face the new ways that always come. We won't be confused by the new law. We can live and work together with patience and peace. This is the end of the story about the beast. Jesus says to you people who belong to him, stand at the crossroad and look as for the ancient path. As where a good way is, and walk in it, then you will find rest for your soul. Jeremiah six sixteen. Okay, so um, not <laughs> it's, it's a great parable based on true events. <laughs> um, good. Um, it's pretty clear that it's an integration, isn't it? There's a message of let's go back to the old ways or maintain the old ways. Uh, but within that is a Christian message of saying to do that, that's what the verse sort of is actually asking them to do, uh, as well as saying God instituted those old ways. So it's a complicated thing. There's obviously questions that arise there, which we don't have time to talk about right now. But that's that's Gala. That That's sort of a typical... Um, emblematic sort of moment of the Gawa Christian school, that sort of story. As I said, it's in English and Watermere, so um, using the text to actually develop print-based literacy in both languages is part of the aim. And then, of course, it wouldn't make sense to not do what the story said. The story said, go back and learn all the ancient ways, which is part of the seasonal life <laughs> that's maintained these things. So. Um, I'll finish off in a moment, but just to show you a few pictures here. Um, it's been used a number of times over the years of Gawa, but when I was there, um, when we studied this text, um, it obviously involved learning about the various honeys that there were, and Yudicha honeys uh, at the time, and that's sort of what you can see there. There was some artwork around other stories, um, and some of that was completely done in language, and I don't know what was said, <laughs> but that doesn't matter, uh, because that was part of my learning, and it was really aimed at the kids, which is much better. Um, part of it was actually going in, of course, eating honey, which was, I understood that. Um, <laughs> it was good. And then uh, with a bit of an Islander English twist, we looked at other sort of um, parables or stories with metaphors, and uh, at the time we sort of contrasted that with the famous Dr. Zeus, the Lorax story, which is you know, a parable of environmentalism and, uh, and did rhyming songs and all that with that. So, um, to me, when I think back at my time of Goa, I'm just saying it's a while ago now, but and many other people have done wonderful things in, in the school as well, different to this, but equally wonderful. But that was sort of how I saw uh, the Warramuri cosmology beginning to push into actually dictating how the school should run, all the way down to actually what was happening in the classroom. And I think that is, education is always going to be one of the huge public policy issues. Um, and so, uh, I thought I'd share that with you today. Mm, thank you. Thank you.